That didn't last very long. Y'all feeling friendly this morning? Normally I have to, to slow you down and cut you off. All right. Well, good to see you this morning. We have a, a few announcements. First off, I want to welcome guests. If you're a first-time guest, especially welcome you. And we are glad you're here. We'd ask you to do us one favor. Uh, there, I don't know if, if D- David usually spots our guests and gives them a card, a uh, connection card. Um, but uh, if you have one of those, if you'd fill that out. So we'd have a record of your visit. We would greatly appreciate it. That guy that just prayed sounded like he's familiar with, with speaking in front of congregations. Um, Pastor Ken. Uh, it reminded me, um, he's a, if you don't know Pastor Ken, most of you know Pastor Ken. He was a pastor, still a pastor. That never goes away. But uh, I, I was uh, at a new church and I asked, I mean, some of you heard this story, but it just reminded me of some, some people are terrified to speak in public or even pray in public. And I asked some, the guy in the front, one of our deacons, I said, uh, hey, uh, Kit, will you pray for us? And he goes, nope. <laughs> it's like, okay, I need to ask and qualify uh, who's willing and who's, who's able. So that was the first time. So that's, uh, I, I appreciated that Pastor Ken w- will pray. Uh, anyway, just a funny story, make you laugh a little bit. We have a couple of announcements to make, and Steve's going to come share some updates on disaster relief. Uh, Women in Northside Bible Study, you see that coming up this week. And um, I w- want to have a special time of prayer when we are, when, after Steve shares. Um, well, one, let me look to happening in August. We are doing a later church council meeting uh, intentionally as we talk this week through some of our leadership uh, things this week and this month in our sermon series on bodybuilding, uh, on, on the biblical fr- framework of the church. So we'll be doing that the same weekend we're having our indoor work day. Now that doesn't mean we won't do some things outdoor if you're willing to get scorched a little bit. Uh, we, we will have some outdoor things as well uh, for you to do. So uh, but be praying specifically um, for uh, some of you on the prayer chain, got that, the, the text for uh, our friend Grayson that preached, my southern, very southern friend that came and preached for us a couple months back. He was in a motorcycle. He does motocross a bit and had a terrible accident last night. So he's in the hospital. Uh, be praying for him. He has a concussion, a punctured lung, and a number of things. Uh, so be praying for him and his family. Um, he's stable and doing well. So... As far as we know, we haven't got a whole lot of updates. And we also want to pray for uh, Phil Clements. Um, Dad, you want to speak to that? Some of y'all know Phil. He used, was a longtime member of Northside. Uh, I've had enough of holes in the roof of my house. And I'm sure some of you don't want one either. So uh, thank you, Steve. Let's pray together and uh, we'll continue to worship and sing together. Lord, we thank you so much for today. Thank you for. Uh, the gift of gathering with uh, other believers that you've given us this uh, not just as a an option but you've called us to do it together that we need one another we need we need friendships we need family we need um, to unify together and, and be reminded that we are not alone Lord it seems uh, as always we've uh, that, that your kingdom is against the grain and uh, we need to be reminded that, uh, that, that we are uh, better together. And God, we, so we thank you for this time. May we be repentant. It's, it's your kindness that leads us to repentance. And that is a great thing to be in pursuance of you and not in, in our own ideas and our own ways and our own wants, uh, Lord. But may we rest and abide in you this morning. What I pray for Grayson and his family, I pray your healing. I pray your spirit is uh, sensed felt. Um, Lord, I pray for those who have no answers this morning, who uh, don't even know who to pray to, um, looking for, for maybe their own way. Uh, Lord, maybe they're in need. And Lord, I pray they, that they would uh, see you for who you are, or that uh, we know you make yourself known if we seek. So Lord, I pray for those. I pray for Phil. I pray for his family. I pray for to, for him to walk close to you, the shepherd, through this time of grief, through the valley of the shadow of death. And you say you're with us. So, Lord, um, I pray that he senses your presence. And God, I pray this morning as we talk about um, your church, and you've given us uh, uh, the privilege of being a part of it. Lord, may we strengthen 
our, our core here, that we might uh, shine light to the city that needs you greatly, that we might make your name great in the city of Apopka. We pray in your name, Jesus. Amen. Please stand as you're able. All right, how many of you in here love English, the subject English, writing papers, things like that, reading books? All right, and how many of you were the, the kids in school no one likes that loves math? A right, few of you. I was one of those guys that struggled at math, and here's what I found out about myself as a math student. I needed to know, I didn't, know the form, I didn't need the formula to memorize, I needed to know the logic and how it worked, how it fit together. Why is this affecting this? It's just my logical brain. And even I noticed this uh, methodical thing in my head too. Some of us are just, let's just go and do, just give me the formula, let's go. Uh, but there's definitely value in you knowing why you're doing what you're doing and knowing the process. And I find myself in some of this is, is, is some of the ADD mindset of just circling things and, and, and analyzing, overanalyzing things. I told you guys I have the, this gift and curse of being analytical, of thinking, how can we do this simpler, or, or what tool can we use, and laying out the tools before you dive into the, the, the process. And my dad gets frustrated with me that, that, like, let's just do this, you know, if we were ever working together on things. And, and so... So today we're going to do some of that, and, and don't check out if you just go, yeah, I just want to come to church, and just roll. Everyone has a place, and everyone has a, a reason to be here um, in service to your local body, the church, the local body of the church. Uh, there is no such thing as inactive members at a church. Everyone has a role, everyone has a responsibility, just like in a family. I think the family best mirrors the church. You hear Jesus using many comparisons as he talks about the church. And in here, uh, Paul's talking about the body that, that is built together. So the next four weeks, we're going to be covering some terms you might not be familiar with. I'll define those, but some of them you've assumed already. You don't know you, you, you do, and we'll explain those. But the biblical role of elders, pastors, lay pastors. Today, we're talking about leadership in general and the church, and not just, when you say leadership, don't just think me, you as well. Everyone leads somewhere. You're all leading. Uh, whether you like it or not, you lead somebody in some way. So the role of elders, in parentheses here, mental parentheses, pastor slash lay pastor. Biblically, I'm an elder, according to the scripture. It doesn't mean older people. That's not the word elder we're thinking of. It's teachers, overseers, shepherds of the church. Biblical role of deacon, that's all through the scripture. And these are servants, mercy ministry, and the biblical role of the congregation. The local church body, when I say the word congregation, it's talking about all of us together, united. Of course, there's congregations all over the place, but specifically Northside, the local church body. And again, uh, there's no such thing as inactive members. I, I'm calling this morning, uh, this, this title, if you're writing down notes, The Trellis. The Trellis. I know I had a different title in the, at the beginning uh, on the front page of your bulletin, but this is called The Trellis. Uh, and I want you to, to, to stay with me on this. I'm going to read you a little illustration I read in an article that really was on point with what we're talking about this morning. And you might be thinking, Aaron, this is going to be boring. I don't want to talk about organization. Uh, and, le and, we and leadership for weeks. But, but watch this, and I hope you see this, and I hope, you're, you, I hope I'm showing you this in Scripture. We have patterns that happen in life. Patterns that happen in life. And we can look at the church. Again, God compares us to a body. Uh, God, uh, God talks about the church being, uh, um, he, he, here he's talking about children here. And he talks about him being the, the, the bride and the groom we have patterns, and it starts at the root of our relationship with God and our relationship with others. And that affects everything. So the church really mirrors, it's, it's relational at its core, God and, and others. And that mirrors family, that mirrors relationship. Last week I talked about marriage, right? And in marriage, the way we treat our spouses is the way we're going to treat everybody else, ultimately. It's a spillover, it's like a, a rock in the pond, a ripple effect, so these patterns apply anywhere you are. So as we talk about the church, we're talking about what is the church? Is it brick and mortar? 
No, it's people. So the way we function here is a healthy uh, mirror of where we fun- how we function everywhere else in life and how we do life with others and relationships. The call here is that God is saying, you know, I'm gi- I've given the church a way to live. You mirror that here, people will see it. People will see that. They'll recognize it. And it should be attractive. Your living together in unity will be attractive. Because if we talk unity in the church, that's how it should be. Do we think unity outside of this building? Is unity happening right now in our culture? Not at all. So we're, we're set apart. We're different. And people will see that. And here's the good news. God didn't leave us alone just as they go at it. Figure it out. He gave us truths. He gave us ideas. He gave us uh, principles to, to go by, to live by. So the church mirrors the family. I think that's the closest. The family was, was uh, ordained before the church. And this is why the qualification of church leadership is one of those, is that you manage your family well. Um, that doesn't mean everybody does what you're supposed to, but this just says you you're, you're care about other people. It's not about you. And even as a parent, if it's all about you, you're headed for some downward spirals in the future. So let me read this article to you. My uh, pastor named Paul Alexander, he's pastor of Grace Covenant Baptist Church in Eline, Illinois. A trellis is a framework built to bear the weight of a living vine so the organism can grow freely and bear fruit. If the trellis is too thick or intricate, it inhabits and chokes the vine. If the trellis is too thin or delicate, it collapses under the weight of the fruit. But a simple, sturdy, spacious trellis gives the vine a structure to climb, air to breathe, and room to grow. And we can think of this again in the family. If we're just pressing and we want to release our children and those in our family to live, to grow. The ministry structure of the church is like a trellis. A minimal framework built to facilitate the growth of the organism. The members and their discipling relationships among each other are the branches of the vine that produce fruit of Christian convictions, new conversions, godly character, and holy conduct. The trellis is the institutional structure that holds and harnesses that organic growth so the fruit doesn't fall to the ground and bruise or rot before it ripens. So the trellis is the growth. And again, we could connect this with a family. Our structures and roles in our family are to produce growth from all those in our family. And so we're talking here about our church family. And it's important that everyone knows and does their part. The church, is a, the church framework is in the Bible. Now, just like we talked about last week, God gives us some principles. He gives us, here you go, humans. This is how you live, but he doesn't spell out every bit of wisdom and practical application in everything in life. It takes wisdom. It takes mulling that over. It takes praying through those things. So sometimes because of our pragmatism, we want the application uh, and we focus on that. We insert a way and we make the pragmatism the way. That is the application of it or how we do it. And we say, this is the way to do it because we want quick answers. But God's word is our authority, not our pragmatism. So there's some things we've assumed maybe, and maybe we in Northside come from all different backgrounds, like this is the way that church is done. This is is the biblical way, and a lot of it's our pragmatism. It's just a methodology we use at the time uh, to roll, to go. And it's not necessarily God's authority. So I'm going to use that. I'm going to find one more term because I might slip into it. I want you to know what it means. Polity. And that is the government or church uh, of the church. Now, government puts a bitter taste in your mouth when I say that. So it's, don't think of it this way. It's organization, authorities. And we all have some authority in some sense. But ultimately, our authority is Christ. Now, I'm making an exhaustive. Uh, this is not exhaustive, excuse me. There's all different ter- interpretations. But I'm going to throw out some ways you might have grown up if you grew up in the church under the, like the church polity of that church. How many of you grew up in church? Raise your hand if you grew up in church. Uh, how many of you grew up in another place other than a Baptist church? Raise your hand. All right. So that, yeah, probably less than half. So see if any of these ring a bell with you. Congregational, 
congregationalism, where and everyone is somewhat congregational. Congregation has a part. Uh, there are churches that are board run. Uh, they're ruled or led. Now, I don't, I'm not real keen on the, the word rule. We'll talk about that later. Led, pastor led. Some of you have been in pastor. I've heard stories of some of your pastors who were more kings than shepherds. That's not a great thing. Uh, or pastor ruled, which is not a great thing either. Where he does, calls out all the shots, no one has to say. Staff led, you've seen some where their staff, they have multiple people on their staff. It's essentially in larger churches, they make most of the decisions of the church. And again, there's good and bad in all this. Some are a little bit power hungry and, and do too much and, and don't listen to other people and so forth. So we're just talking about some of these structures. Again, this is not exhaustive. Deacon led, if you grew up Baptist, maybe that was how it was. And uh, I'll just say it right now, that's about as biblical as Malachi chapter 5. Okay? And if you don't know what Malachi chapter 5 is, it only has four chapters. Malachi does. So, um, we'll talk about deacons more. And I'm, I'm just going to tease these a little bit and, and unpack them more in the weeks ahead. And then elder-led. Elder-led where uh, overseers and so forth lead. So, some of your churches, when we're talking about poly, have business meeting monthly. Some have it weekly. Some have it quarterly. Uh, some don't have them at all. Some have them once a year. Some never. Some have services all the time. Some have night services. Some have midweek services. Uh, some vote on everything. Some vote on nothing. And I even heard this this week. He's talking about the differences in churches. I heard a church in L.A. where this guy was talking about going to this church. He said that this guy owned. You ever heard of that? Like his name is on the church. He owns the church. I don't know what how he's working that, what it is, but that was new to me. A guy owns a church with his name, like a brand on it. Um, interesting. So uh, there's some things that, that's probably Malachi chapter 5 too, right? Uh, uh, my, my buddy and I used to use that to say if, if, if we, we said something and we didn't know where it was, that's in Malachi chapter 5, so you can use that if you need it. Uh, some things are unclear, but, but some things are exclaim, extremely clear. And the office of elder, deacon, and congregation are, are at the, the, the building blocks of the church, uh, the greater church. And the pragmatics are often uh, not so much of how these things play together. And there can be imbalance. But watch this. As in anything, God's give us, given us roles in the family. God's given us roles to live together as human beings. If we get out of check and sin taints, it falls apart. That's the nature of the world. That's the nature of creation. There's rhythms. There's patterns. God, there's roles. And from the beginning, God designed us that way. When sin corrupts, things fall apart. So any of these systems can work if the heart's right. Right? It's, it's when the heart gets out of check that it falls apart. I mean, I've, I've jokingly about seen, I'm, I've joked, I'm joked in, joking about deacon-led churches, and I've seen godly Men that, that, that love their church, and it's worked. I don't think it's a biblical system, but it's worked. But then I've seen ones who were all about the business and about them, and they've destroyed churches. Uh, because, again, inward, not serving. It, it, this is all rooted in what we talked about last week, others first. That's at the heart. If this guy in the pulpit is ever not about others first, get rid of him. Okay? Because that's our call. Others first. Not about me. Not, and I'm saying that for, I'm saying 20 years from now. Some of you are still here. 30 years from now, you know, youngins, if you're still part of Northside, and you ever got a pastor, it's not me that's about himself. Uh, I don't say just get rid of him, you know, deal with it godly. We'll talk about that in another sermon. So, uh, anywho, uh, you've been in, many of you have been in churches where, um, Sin has marred the church. Sin mars the church like anything else. And the heart of following Christ is unselfishness. And it's our pride that causes falls. And power has no place in the church, much less anything. Power, uh, knowledge is not power. It's not Jesus' mantra. Love is power. You hear that? Love is power. That's our source. So how many of you have ever been in a church that's had problems? I mean, Northside's never had any problems, right? Uh, but, but we have people. We, we ha we're people. We're sinful. We're broken. 
And uh, maybe you've experienced people or groups on power trips. If you've lived, you've experienced that. Maybe in your own family it happens. Uh, but like with any situation, any, any uh, group uh, that happens. Now the question, watch this, that we're going to talk about as we talk about the church and God's design for the church is not which group is over the other. That's not the design. Nor is it a matter of greater or lesser authority. All have authority in some sense, and some have more authority, but it's in submittance to the ultimate authority, and that's where things align. That's where, I mean, some of you have worked in groups here on committees, on teams, you've done that before, and you know if the leader and the heart's right of that committee, it's good. Uh, if they're not in service to our Lord, it's not. And so uh, the question we need to ask ourselves is, are we in submittance to our ultimate authority, Jesus? God calls you to lead all the time and make decisions in your life. And that needs to be central. Are you in submittance to Christ? Because you will love others better by loving him first. You hear that? That's, that's at the heart of it all. That's in everything you do. I will love my wife better by loving Jesus most. Because he fills my tank. I can't do it on my own. It runs dry. So, uh, Rich, throw that, the first uh, picture up for me. You might have seen this. I like this leader. This, uh, this leader. I like this picture. Just take a while to look and process that. A boss versus a leader. Some of you guys that are in high positions right now in your jobs, watch this. Because <laughs> you find yourself sometimes on the back when the bottom is where God calls us. That's just good leadership. This is not out of some sort of Christian magazine or, or site. This is just people talking about good leadership. This is what Jesus modeled. He led first front lines in the trenches with you. Now show that second one. Here's some extra additives in that picture. And again, this isn't from necessarily a Christian source, but it's good stuff. I'm not going to talk about those, but you can just read it. Think about it. Maybe you're a, a, a boss or teacher right now in your job or wherever you are. Some of you need to write this down, <laughs> right? But that's good stuff. Think I'm thinking of it that way. So the question is not, and Rich, you can just leave that other one up, or just leave that up, that's fine. Just don't read that while I'm talking too much, all right? The question is not who's responsible or who's in charge. Think about this. The question is, who is responsible for what, and who is in charge of what? Not who's in charge, or who's responsible, but who's in charge of what? We all have a responsibility in the church. The Bible teaches roles, and the Bible teaches first among equals. And this is one of the reasons I, I think, and, and not all guys do this, and they don't have to, but I try to show you and, and I believe God has called us to this, to be open, an open book, and show that the pastor, the, the, the guy that God has appointed as, as the leader of the church, is vulnerable like you. I'm in the trenches with you. I'm doing life. I, I get down. I have struggles. I, I, I have to repent. I'm not perfect. I'm with you. I'm just in a different role. And your prayers don't get to God any slower than mine. Some of you probably get faster to God than mine. All right? So, so God has us in different roles. He's called us to different things. And who did Jesus put first when we think? I was thinking about this. It's like if Jesus showed up at Northside, well, we probably wouldn't hang around Northside. We'd probably be going home. But if he showed up on any given Sunday or any time of the week, he probably didn't want to hang out with me. He's probably going to be hanging out with the people that clean the toilets and clean up the church and mow the yard, right? That's kind of how he rolled. The, the people we don't think are the leader type, Right? He would go to the people that were unexpected. So things are different in God's economy. Who leads the church? Pastors lead the church. Pastors. You hear that with an S. So even a singular pastor, there are multiple pastors. I've talked about this uh, over the course of the years I've been here. In the New Testament, planters and pastors that were starting, the church was starting, and, and they were going out to cities, added the, the, these word elders. And some of you might have read that for years and go, that's just old people, right? Then, no, that, that's overseers, shepherds in the church and deacons. They surrounded themselves with help. 
He didn't go, all right, go plant the church, stay and handle it all yourself. Surround yourself with people. Go back to Ecclesiastes 4, that, that verse that many of you are familiar with, that it says in 4.2, better than one, but a three-strand, or two are better than one, but a three-strand cord is not easily broken. And this is the idea here, that we don't go it alone. We don't lead alone. Paul, writing to Titus in 1.5, listen to this. I left you on the island of Crete, Titus, alone, so you can complete our work there and appoint elders in each town as I instructed you. So there's two offices in the church, and we name them different things. We name them different things. We sometimes call them different things, but these are existent. They're in the scripture. They didn't go away. Elder, which can, is simultaneously used, interchangeably used with elder, pastor, bishop, and deacon, which is servant leader. Don't think, when, you, when I say deacon, don't think the guys that run the church. Uh, servant leader, the missions of, of, of mercy. That's their call. Ministers of mercy, serving alongside with elders, pastors, shepherds. So we have in our current bylaws, and we haven't even laid them, we haven't necessarily implemented these, but it's, and I'll share these when I talk about that biblical term elders, we have in there lay pastors, and essentially is pretty well framed and worded in there of their role. A pretty good description that uh, we haven't really implemented formally. So in Acts 15, 22, I want you to see where this all works together. The whole church working together in decisions. And this is just some, I'm, I, I normally preach from one text. I'm going to be kind of all over the place in the next few weeks. But listen to this. In Acts 15, 22, it says, The apostles and the elders, together with the whole church in Jerusalem, chose delegates. And they sent them to Antioch of Syria with Paul and Barnabas to report on the decision. Hear that? It said the elders, the apostles, together with the whole church. The whole church. It wasn't just one or the other. They, they decided collectively. The men chose, chosen were two of the church leaders, Judas, also Barabbas, and Silas. And then Matthew 18, 15, and this is a great verse. If you ever have conflict, use it in your life, okay? This is for the church, but it's for you individually too. If another believer sins against you, this is a good, again, write this down for dealing with conflict. This is, conf this is God's prescription for conflict 101. Go privately and point out the offense. Hear that? Don't gossip about it. Don't share with people. Go private and deal with whoever's offended you. One-on-one. -on -one. If the other person listens to you confess and confesses it, you've won that person back. But if you are unsuccessful, take one or two others with you and go back again so that everything you say may be confirmed by two or three witnesses. If the person still refuses to listen, take your case to the church. To the church. So the church is involved in, in, in dealings of authority in the church. Then if he or she won't accept the church's decision, treat that person as a pagan or a corrupt tax collector. And again, that's another sermon, but what that's meaning is leave them, like if, if someone was doing some gravest public sin here in, in our church that was causing the church name to be bad, you're, you're saying, look, you're not following what we need. You, you turn them over and hopefully they'll come back like the prodigal son. Uh, you turn them over and say, go. Uh, and hopefully they'll see that darkness is not good and, and living that way is not good and come back in repentance. The goal is restoration there. So, helpful elements of a solid trellis as we talk about the church being a trellis. Foundational documents. Some of you don't care, don't, don't know if we do or not, uh, but uh, there's things called church constitution and bylaws. Uh, it's who we are, who we're committed to. And I share these when we have new members classes. So you know, this is who we are. This is how we do things, how we function. Beliefs, statements of faith, non-negotiables that, that describe who we are. This is what separates us as Northside from some other group or even cult. This is our foundation. This is what we believe. And this is important. A church covenant signed by members of saying this is what we're committing to and living together, that we have a responsibility, that we're accountable. It stabilizes our expectations of character and conduct among those who call themselves members. We represent Northside when we're out in the community, and we ultimately represent Jesus. 
And then governance and officers. An evident growing structure such as elder-led congregational, uh, congregational governance uh, provides clarities of roles and responsibilities. In a congregational church, ultimate authority on matters like doctrinal disputes and discipline and membership rests with the entire gathered church. And at the same time, we have shepherds and elders and overseers that offer leadership as primary teachers and equippers of that congregation. And then deacons serve in practical and financial capacities to promote unity and foster preservation of the church. Now there's a ton of scriptures, and I'll unpack those over the weeks ahead. There's a ton of scriptures to go behind that if you would like to see them. And beyond these roles, every member has a personal responsibility to engage in prayer and love and disciple making and giving in collaboration with those overseers. So we also provide meetings on, uh, so here we are this morning, right? That's part of the trellis meetings, weekly gatherings uh, that, that we want the vines to grow. We provide environments to grow, to have community with one another. We have family member meetings where we talk about the business of the church. These things just don't happen. We need to work together on these things. We have new members classes. I referenced that where people know what they're committing to when they become a member of Northside, that you have an expectation for the flourishment of yourself. This is what God's called you to, to be an active member and a part of a committed group of people. And then the scripture talks about some elders, overseers, shepherds being paid to commit and keep the ship running, right? You got one of those here, right? He's talking to you. And this is a scriptural thing. It's not an idea that the church just came up with to, to fill a void. The scripture talks about in 1 Timothy 5, 17 through 18, it supports a paid pastor slash staff. So they can devote themselves to the church fully without distraction to keep things going. So, ultimately, again, some of these words might be foreign to you, even the word deacon, the word elder, but we talk, we're talking about, I, I've said all along, we've have, we have these, even if we haven't formally put a stamp on them, they're here. They're in every church. They're in every church. And it's helpful to know and to be able to recognize those people and what they do and, and who they are. Uh, so we can keep, again, the trellis healthy so the vines can grow. I mean, we've started to do this early on with saying who's in charge of what, who's over what team, what committee, and so forth. Uh, so we know who to go to for whatever need it is. Bottom line, guys, that the church is unhealthy if, if it's all about let's just come and let's just hear one guy. It is a multiplication principle that that. I am replicating myself as you replicate yourself. We're all replicating ourselves. This is called making disciples. This is called sharing the load. Because you know what? There's right now about 50, 60 of us here. And there are thousands of people out there who don't know Jesus. And as they come and they grow and you replicate yourself, you don't say, hey, just be just like me. But hey, know the God I know and love. And I want to lead you that direction. That's what we do. And we are better together. We are better working collectively as a system to provide an environment where people can come in, come in here and grow. Those vines, go back to the trellis that we are a vines growing. The scripture calls us that. We want to provide a place for them to flourish and grow towards Christ. So watch this. Do you see Jesus in this? This wasn't just a business meeting, okay? I hope you get this. I want to show you the gospel in this. This is a picture of the gospel. When we look at what sin has done to relationships and to cooperating together, sin destroys unity. Everything I'm talking about this morning is unity. And part of our call is to submit to one another. You know what? And I'm not saying, oh, kudos, I'm, I'm a, what a good guy I am. I'm just talking about the position of pastor, the one that's up here preaching every Sunday and, and trying to lead this body. I, and I've said this before, if it comes to a matter of the kitchen, what do I do? I default in service 
to Deborah. Deborah's not the pastor. She's not a pastor here. But I default to her because that's her gifting. She can run that kitchen well and keep things moving and in order. Right? Amen. Right? If it's something to fix a mower or something like that, I don't go, I got this figured out because I'm the pastor. No, I go to the old pastor to check with that, right? <laughs> I used to be here. Well, what is that thing doing? It doesn't sound right. Can you get it? Can, do you know someone who can do this? Yeah, we, we, we submit to others. This is, this is good leadership. This, this, is, this is the thing, guys. That the, the, the business world didn't create good leadership. God did. And we borrow from him on all these things. You've heard it preached in the business world, service leadership. They're just borrowing from what God designed. Then they want to take it and do their own thing with it and it ends up imploding because you've got to stick wholly to his design or it doesn't work. We take it and go our own way with it, it falls apart. That's what we've done. That's what we want. We want a little God here, but we don't want to submit to his authority totally. This is what the world has done. So God's church should be the most unified part in this world, the, the most unified body, uh, the most eclectic group in the world, light and darkness, showing them the antithesis of what the world is seeing, that we can be in harmony, that we can be from different backgrounds and different ethnicities, that we can be uh, from different sides of the city, that we can be from different even uh, social statuses, whatever. Doesn't matter. Our unity is in Christ. And that wins. We are, this is why the Bible calls us a city on a hill. Light and darkness. John 13, 34. Listen to this. This wraps us up. A new command I give to you. Love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. If you love one another. So what does it show people when we serve gladfully? When we serve them gladfully. Jesus loved and died for his church. It's battered. It's scarred. It's not represented well oftentimes. But he has not given up on us. He's not given up on the church. And we shouldn't give up on people either. He didn't give up on you. No matter how far you've gone, he hasn't given up on you. He's given the church as a gift to the world and as a gift of salvation. He's given us the gift of salvation and told us to go and proclaim that, that he's king, that he rules, that there is a better way. Remember, as we think about the patterns of life, may we be a pattern of his kingdom. That's why we exist, church. We're a pattern, a reflection of of that kingdom that is to come, that kingdom he's established. As he said, it's already here, essentially, but not yet. It'll be fully consummated when he comes. It'll be fully consummated when we leave this life and see the kingdom for what it is. But until then, we're practicing it here, Northside. He died for his church. That's you. Stay with me. Last sentence here, okay? Look at me. He died for his church. That's you. Hang on that. So you might be in his kingdom. All right, let's pray together. Lord, we thank you so much for the gift of salvation, for knowing you. Lord, that we aren't left to go at life alone. You are not a celestial Santa Claus in the sky we call on when we just need things. Uh, But you are available. And you've shown us a way to live. You've shown us a way to love. We don't come up with this stuff on our own. We don't come up with put others first. We don't come up with not be selfish. We don't come up with uh, love our neighbor as ourself. It's your design. It's your revelation you've given us. So we say thank you. Lord, we see the world borrowing, trying to borrow from some of the good parts they like and then throwing away what they don't. It's not working. Lord, we pray we submit to you wholly. God, I pray for your church as Northside as we try to be this, uh, I'm hesitant to use the word structure because we're a body, we're organic. At the same time, we want to find what you want us to do individually. That's what it boils down to. So we might be the most effective to share your good news with other people. 
to grow, to be the people you want us to be individually. So Lord, lead us that way. God, if there's someone here that doesn't know you, may they step towards you. May they know you. May they know that their only hope is in you. It's not a temporal hope. It's not just a fix for today, but it's a satisfaction, a delight of knowing that there's more than the circumstances of this life, than the day-to-day ups and downs. May you be our filling. May you be our substance, Lord. And we pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing together, and I'm going to be up in the front if you wish to pray with me for anything. I want to ask Pastor Ken in the back um, to stand, and if you would like to pray with him, maybe he's closer to you. You feel free to pray with one of us, and, uh, or maybe you're here with a neighbor to say, hey, would you pray with me about something? Pray. Continue to do that. Pray for your church. Pray for Northside as we continue to move ahead. Uh, we want to reach people. We want to disciple those who are here and have them grow. And we want to let them know this good news that we're talking about. That God cares and loves them. People, that they, people need care. People need hope. I mean, we can see this every day. We want to share that good news with them. And pray that the Lord makes us the most effective to do that. And, and then ask yourself, pray about, where's, where's my place? What am I doing here? And what can I do? Not to guilt you, that is not the idea, but to live, really live, to live. So let's stand and sing together. Those around you, serve them well as the Lord has served us. I go back to last week thinking about uh, we are born, me for me. And we still fight that regularly. And the gospel calls us his life for us, our life for others. Do that with the people closest to you. And watch this. Do that with the world around you. Do that with the world around you. Even, watch this, even the people you don't like. Try to serve. Try to love. Try to love without expectation. Try to love without a take away. Just give because he's given to you freely. And that will change the world, church. Uh, so pray over these next few weeks. Pray that you find your place. We want to throw fuel on your fire uh, wherever you are and living out your life for the Lord. So receive your benediction this morning. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. And may the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Go and serve in his name as he has served you so well. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.